thanks for coming and speaking to us at Future Day. I appreciate that. It's really good that you can spend time to do so. Um, now, uh, the subject of machine understanding or intelligence, with which understands is something that was brought up at AGI 17 um, in Melbourne, which I was at, and I thought that was very fascinating. But um, yeah, I wanted to get your idea on what machine understanding is. Yeah, so what's the name of your talk again? <laughs> well, we can figure out a name for the talk after the talk is done. It was tentatively, are we building psychopathic idiots of Ant Global Brain, right? Are we? <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, yeah, so, all right, welcome, Ben. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Adam. And uh, um, I'm, right. I'm happy to chat a bit about machine understanding and AGI and, and all that. And uh, I'll also verge a bit into some, some broader topics. Uh, as, as we know that I've, I've been thinking a lot about the global brain and the notion of an AGI being something that emerges from a bunch of different AIs and people and other communication devices. And if we're building a global brain like that, then maybe the general intelligence in one server farm or one decentralized network, but then the general intelligence, which is the whole global brain. And we have to ask what kind of general intelligence is that, is that global brain that we're creating? I mean, is it, is it generally intelligent is one thing. Is it compassionate is another thing. Is it, is it psychopathic, uh, obsessive, compulsive, uh, greedy? What are the characteristics of this global brain AGI that, that we're arguably working toward as a side effect of all the AGI and narrow AI work that we're doing in our own, own research projects? So yeah, there's a whole bunch of interesting issues here. Fortunately, we can solve all of them in the next 20 minutes. So. Fantastic, Ben. Okay, well, um, yeah, do you want to give us a rundown on what you mean by um, global brain? Is this one where we have a, uh, like a, a network swarm-like intelligence? Was it more like yeah, Gaia? Yeah, so the, in the year 2001, Francis Heiligen and I, he, at the Free University of Brussels, we held a conference called Global Brain Zero which was a, a bunch of researchers from around the world discussing the notion of what is a global brain? Is there a global brain? And if there is, like, what, 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 what is it doing? What's its relation to us? And we've actually been talking about doing a, a sequel, Global Brain One conference next year in, uh, in 2021, 20 years after the, fir after the first one. And then, then have the following ones at shorter and shorter time periods as, as we approach the, the singularity, right? Well, one thing that came up in the Global Brain Zero conference was it, it became clear among the participants there were several different ways of thinking about what is a global brain. I mean, the, the concept at the high level, I think, is clear enough. The, the concept is that you have a collective of intelligence spanning multiple computers, multiple communication devices, multiple software programs, multiple people, potentially multiple non-human animals, but through the collective action and the coordination of all these different sub-entities, the whole global network may have a certain intelligence, a certain memory, a certain goal-directedness, and, and the various properties that, that we'd normally associate with a, a mind. So then it becomes a bit disturbing when you think about it. Like, am I just a neuron in, 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 in the global brain? Is, is my illusion of free will just covering up for the fact that I'm, I'm actually just, you know, responding in accordance with the, the stimulations sent in to me by the other neurons in the global brain? And, you know, in, in some areas of science and technology, it really feels like that now, right? So, in, I mean, in, in, in some it doesn't. Certainly, if, if you're working on some foundational mathematical area, the important papers may come out every couple of years, and you you know you may think six months about a new idea before you have something to share with anyone. It's a very individual mode of thought. If you're working in, say, deep neural networks for machine vision or language processing, it's like every day there's three weird new papers that came out by different people, 
each paper is a minor variation on some paper from some other guy. So it's hard to even say, like, where's the Einstein of all this? Where's some amazing new innovation? It's not in any one person's brain or any one person's paper. It's in the collective thought process of that whole research community, which is, which is collaborating together and, and, and making amazing progress. And then, you know, the open source code is going out there on GitHub, different pieces of code are being cut and pasted with each other and, and, and referencing each other. So you can see quite clearly as one example of global brain type dynamics, like in, in certain areas of science and technology with the assistance of modern computing and communication tools, ArcScive, Git, GitHub and whatnot, and as well as just the internet for communication. I mean, you, you can see in some senses, the thought process is collective across a whole bunch of people and a bunch of computer programs. And I mean, at a, at a less impressive and exciting level, I mean, you, you see that with like YouTube influencers and YouTube comments and, 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 and videos and so forth. Like what, what bubbles up to popularity in the YouTube ecosystem is not really any one person's doing, right? It, it, it's a collective activity of a lot of different people, but yet, what becomes popular drives what gets created, right? So in many ways, the whole creative process of the community of people making videos, this whole creative process is, is being driven in a, in a collective way. And I've, I've intentionally given examples at, at opposite ends of this sort of uh, intellectual spectrum, right? Because I mean, transformer networks for AI natural language processing are amazing and the level of brilliant progress that's being made arguably couldn't be made by any one person or small group. It, it's complex and like multifaceted enough. It needs a large collective mind spending many different expertise areas. On the other hand, the comments on YouTube videos are maybe like the, the dregs of the human collective uh, unconscious and, and that they could be viewed to indicate like humans who are fairly intelligent individually, collectively coming together to spend their time creating an emergent global brain that's a complete asshole and moron, right? So they, 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 these are the two aspects of, of these collective global brain dynamics. I mean, it can be amazing and it can be just terrifyingly stupid and, and, and ridiculous by, by our individual human standards. And this, this leads up to a significant question, like if the global brain can become an AGI or a combined artificial natural general intelligence, really, then what kind of AGI is it becoming? And that, I mean, that brings us up to the question you posed me at the, at the beginning of this uh, recording session, which is like, what, what is understanding? Like the, in that light, the question would be, can, the global brain actually understands something or does the understanding in here in the component systems comprising the global brain and you know if it can understand something what are its biases in understanding as well as in in action right and th these are questions that we barely have a good vocabulary to discuss right so in, in the first global brain conference as i was mentioning some people there thought the global brain already existed and we were just not at the right level to understand it. Just like our neurons chatting back and forth don't have a great understanding of the organism that they're embedded in, right? Others, others thought the global brain didn't exist so much yet that it was just gonna evolve and emerge. And others thought the global brain would come to exist because someone would, would build it, right? And what, what seems to be happening now in my view is a combination of the latter two. Like you have big companies are trying to build, in essence, global brains, which entrain all human brain matter and all computing and all data in the world in a coherent process oriented toward making those companies more money. So the people are trying to build kinds of global brains with their own personal or organizational selfish ends in, in, in mind, right? On the other hand, clearly the whole internet ecosystem is evolving in ways that nobody is, is designing. So you have some design and some emergence. And I think, you know, the world is much more global verified than it was in 2001 when we had this conference. 
but I'm still not sure how much of the understanding is at the emergent level versus at the individual level. I think now more of the understanding is still at the individual level, but that transition may come in the next five to 10 years, which is, which is pretty interesting. Like if you, if you look at the case of deep learning research or something, I mean, once you have AI is playing more and more of a role in participating hands-on in the research. I mean, at, at some point, you're getting to level where a network of AIs is co communicating about the research. And then when the network of AIs is talking about the research, instead of just a network of people, the AIs can talk by sending chunks of thought stuff to each other, right? The, the AIs can collaborate much more richly and intensely than, than human beings can, which can lead to a sort of mindplex like like structure which is sort of more more social than an individual human mind but maybe the components are more individualized than uh, than in a board or something but so you may get to the understanding being largely on the emergent level as a result of having more of the component level understanding inside agis and inside people or proto agis because the proto AGIs can just bond together and share information more more flexibly than people like people aren't designed to be components of a global brain. Right? We were designed to be components of a of a primitive tribe, basically. But AGIs could be designed to be part of a global brain, and they could gain many advantages in many areas that way, like science and engineering being being among. Them. Yeah, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, like is, it the, sounds is like... the global is the global brain awakening? Well, um, well, I, I, I'd be interested to see what it would dream if it were sleeping. But um, I can see that, like your point, where even academic structures, you have like a, a general academic field um, that um, that you know uh, different people in that field can communicate about, and then you've got, like, Subdisciplines or experts within sub sort of areas of the academic field who have a like a very rich detailed understanding within a sort of a narrow area, but they need to communicate and and get inputs and provide outputs to other other academics within that field. In a sense, it's kind of like a hive, and you get like and some aspects of understanding which maybe are more like a um, bird's eye view concept navigation slash like you know just overview version of understanding whereas you might get a more detailed version of an understanding within individuals who are experts within um an area of science but yeah it's fascinating and, and so you, that, um, where you could then have in you could even have an agi so this gets dialogue. into like our, our singularity net platform right where singularity net is a way it's a platform using blockchain as sort of the plumbing and infrastructure in which multiple AIs can cooperate with each other, make requests to each other, and outsource work to each other. So hypothetically, in a platform like that, you could have you know, one AI doing language understanding, one doing abstract reasoning, one doing manipulation of, of, of a robot, one that you know, interprets human emotions. They could be coded by different people even like proprietary code. So no one person knows what's inside, inside each of these AI agents and they're cooperating together. And it could be that that coordinated network of AI agents created by different people and without anyone knowing how they all work, that could have the intelligent behavior, which becomes, becomes the first AGI rather than it coming out of, out of one lab. I mean, or as a different route, you could have an AGI revolution where 10 different groups around the world make an AGI breakthrough around the same time, which is how things often happen. But then the AGIs, I mean, so, sort of like in the Colossus, the Forbin project, with hopefully more beneficially, right? That the AGIs start to realize, well, hey, what, why don't we trade ideas? Like some of us are better at some kinds of thinking, some are better at other kinds of thinking. Then, then this, cabal of AGIs that came out of different AI paradigms and different research groups start communicating and coordinating together. 
and maybe they're communicating together on what new AIs to program to join their cabal, right? So that then, then even if the breakthrough to AGI is made in more monolithic systems, the community of AGIs bands together and becomes a, a meta-level mind. Again, because AIs, if they want to, can expose their whole RAM state and all their knowledge to, to other AIs, right? I mean, they can, they can make API calls into each other's brains and email like thought chunks to each other, which, which humans can't do. And then if you look, at, you look at it from an evolutionary sort of competition point of view, if you have 10 AGIs over here that remain separate and 10 AGIs over here that can flexibly share mind stuff with each other, that AGI mindplex will get smarter, right? So I, I, I think that the global brain mode of organization will dominate. That, that doesn't mean a board will dominate, right? Because some level, some level of individuation is probably valuable to allow, allow free exploration, right? You, you don't want every AGI within the like, global brain AGI mindplex. You don't want every AGI to be thinking exactly the same thing in, in exactly the same way because you want the creativity that comes from this weird AGI over here thinking some crazy thing that nobody else agrees with. But I think human society dials things probably further toward the individual than is optimal for a lot of reasons, science and engineering progress being among them. And we can see that through the accelerating progress that comes from better and better communication tools, right? Like, I mean, when, when I was in graduate school, we didn't have that. And you could think a few years about some weird thing before talking to anyone else who understood what you're talking about. There was some advantage there in terms of, you know, you could come up with something creative without hearing the naysayers, right? Without, without knowing that your idea was supposed to be wrong and then you found it was right. On the other hand, you just slowed down so much by not being able to get feedback from the experts in hundreds of other relevant areas. So there's always pluses and minuses, but it's clear from the acceleration of progress that so far increasing the communication bandwidth and the emergent aspect of, of, of cognition and science and engineering, so far that's been a plus and it's gonna keep being a plus for, for a while. We're, we're a long way from the point where things are getting too border-like and we need to dial back to greater anarchy to foster creativity. Would you classify um, understand, machine understanding as the same thing as artificial general intelligence? Do they go hand in hand? Are they somewhat the same? Or they go hand in hand. I mean, I, I think uh, intelligence, we have at least the start of a mathematical theory, right? I mean, Mar Mar Marcus Huder, who also has been at our AGI conference in, in Melbourne, he's, he, I mean, he he he's he's abandoned Australia now, I think. But uh, anyway, anyway, M Marcus laid out the first really rigorous. He's gone to work of take mind. He he's laid out the first really rigorous theory of general intelligence. I mean, based on ideas from Ray Salamanoff and others be beforehand. I mean, I've I've made some modifications and emendations on that, as 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 have a bunch of others. But we. We sort of have the idea that general intelligence, you know, within a computable universe paradigm, which could be argued against, but it's a reasonable place to start. If you assume the universe is computable, you can look at general intelligence as, you know, optimizing computable functions based on computable environments. And sort of the broader the spectrum of functions you can optimize and the broader scope of environments, the more generally intelligent you are. Now, I, I don't think that captures everything that's interesting about minds. I'm, my friend uh, Weaver, David Weinbaum, has a beautiful PhD thesis called Open-Ended Intelligence, where he looks at intelligence more as a system, just creating new patterns and exploring new directions based on, on coupling with its environment. So that, there's certainly still a lot to be learned and modeled in the question of what is intelligence, but I think it, at least, we have a decent start there. Understanding there's not such a rigorous, even a start to the rigorous understanding of, 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 of understanding, right? Because how, how do you tell 
if someone understood something, well, you you ask them about it, or you try to get them to do something based on it, and and then then you're basically checking how well can they optimize certain functions. You're you're back to the definition of of general intelligence from Mar Mar Marcus Huder at at all. Because understanding you can think of as like what is what is the internal representation, like how does the system need to represent knowledge internally in a way that it can achieve a high level of intelligence given limited computing resources. And that, to me, that's what understanding is about. Like if, if you have essentially infinite resources, Marcus Hoder showed you can be arbitrarily intelligent with a really, really dumb, simple algorithm, right? But that's not how any organism we know in the physical universe so far works, right? We, the way evolution of species worked is all sorts of biological and chemical contortions were made to be able to achieve goals given limited energetic spatial temporal resources. So if you have limited resources and you want to optimize a variety of functions in a variety of environments, I mean, then, then you need to be clever about how you leverage those limited resources to sort of mirror in your own mind some of the knowledge that you've gained in, in your interaction with the world. So understanding somehow is the way that intelligent systems represent knowledge in their, in their limited resources that enables them to be intelligent. But then how do you measure whether they're actually understanding what you just measure, like how intelligent they are and how limited their resources are, right? So then understanding is sort of, it's at one remove to what's measurable. On the other hand, if you're building an AGI system, you probably want to think a lot about it, right? Because, I mean, how, how the knowledge is represented in your system is, is super important. So if you look at current deep neural net algorithms, it's easy to see that they're not understanding things in the way that humans are. What they're doing is recognizing a very large number of very simple patterns in the data that they're, that they're exposed to. And the fact that they're working by recognizing this humongous catalog of simple patterns, artfully arranged in a hierarchy, this is why they don't generalize to qualitatively different areas than, than the data that they were trained on, right? And in some applications, that's no issue. Like if you're recognizing human faces, I mean, fine, there's 1.5 billion faces or whatever, and you know, there's not that many faces with like, Three, three noses or dragons leaking out of the eyebrows or something, right? So you, it's not a problem if you overfit to the scope of 1.5 billion human faces. That represents the variety that, that's needed. It's okay if you don't have an elegant, compact, abstract model of a human face. You can represent a human face as like a billion simple patterns arranged in a hierarchy. It's fine. You're still recognizing all the human faces that are out there. Now, financial prediction or economic prediction is a different case because, you know, past performance need not indicate future returns, right? I mean, the, the structure of financial markets up till today may be qualitatively different in, in unforeseeable ways from the structure of financial markets in the next five years. So that a deep learning system that was trained on financial markets going back in history because it's representing a large catalog of simple patterns, it's not gonna be able to like pivot and adapt to a market that's evolving in a fundamentally different regime. It's as well as say Warren Buffett can, or, or a handful of humans who are especially good at transfer learning in, the, in a financial markets context. So there, like face recognition is something where the type of understanding that deep neural nets are doing is okay. Financial markets, I think, is an example where the type of understanding that current deep neural nets are doing is less okay. Although, I mean, it can still do, it can still do something. It can probably still make more money than the average person, but it's gonna get screwed when there's a regime change in the markets. And then I think you need a kind of understanding that is more abstract. And interestingly, I mean, the degree of abstraction is tied to the amount of compute resources, right? Because if, if you look at a certain level of general intelligence, like a certain level of optimization performance in a certain class of environments, to achieve that level of intelligence with just a little resources, 
requires more abstract representations, a more abstract sort of understanding than achieving that same level of intelligence with a larger amount of, of, of computing resources. So I, I would say if you had something that could do what current deep neural nets do while using like one ten thousandth of the amount of compute resources, it's probably going to be doing that by getting a more high level abstract representation of, of the data that it's looking at and the problems it's trying to solve. And as a result of having that more abstract representation, it's going to be able to generalize better to things qualitatively different than what it was trained on to do better, better transfer learning. And I mean, all, all this is sort of very well known in, in statistical learning theory, but in the last few years, we're starting to see it, you know, manifest itself in, in reality. And if, if you look at the global brain, coming back to that and, and, how, how, and the global brain versus individual level intelligence, I mean, you see this, the pressure for limited resources is everywhere, right? I mean, you, you don't need to have evolution, you know, red in tooth and claw to, to, to have a pressure for intelligent systems to represent things compactly to deal with complex goals in the face of limited, limited resources. I mean, that, that, that's just there because of the physical regi regime that we live in. There's only so much RAM, there, there, there's only so many processors and people need to get a lot of stuff done. So I, th I think we see on the global brain level, as, as, as we saw in the evolution of, of humanity biologically and continue to see in the evolution of humanity culturally. I mean, we see on the global brain level, this pressure for doing complex stuff with small amount of resources, which is what drives you to abstract representations, which is, is one way of looking at, at understanding and i think you're going to get agis and distributed networks of agis and humans that are coming up with elegant concise representations of complex you know perceptions and, and goals and actions that are of a nature that humans can't understand right and and that that's uh, that that's when we're really getting to the to the singularity right when when, when you're seeing understanding that is different than human understanding, not because it's a huge catalog of particular patterns that humans just don't have time to read through, but because it's a form of concise, elegant abstraction that just defies the human cognitive limitations and, and, and humans, humans can't get it, right? And you, you get that feeling if you study strings. Cybernetic things, singularity. Right? You, you already get that feeling looking at, looking at some areas of math and science. Yeah, interestingly, um, humans are very good at identifying causes. Um, but it seems like people argue that computers have shown like a, a very good ability at correlating lots of information together, like especially data sets and finding correlations and making excellent predictions on things, but are really bad at causation, um, understanding causes. I, th I think that's um, just because of, of people who have said it's just because of what we've used computers for so far. I don't think there's anything intrinsic there. It's just that we learn to understand causation via actions rather than perceptions. And right now, most of what AI has been used for has been more machine perception oriented rather than than action oriented. So I think once once you're doing action in open domains, then then you learn causation very well. And then I think computers will learn causation much better than people. Because I mean we we can be very, very dumb at learning causation actually. I mean we confuse correlation with causation constantly in, in, our, in our everyday life, let alone in, in scientific areas. But I think yeah, you need, say, say once you have uh, autonomous robots buzzing around in, in, on, the, on the planet, just bumping into stuff and carrying out tasks and, and uh, get, getting frustrated and finding novel ways to get things done in the face of a dynamic world. I mean, what, once, what, 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 once that's an operational reality, Computers are going to learn causation very, very rapidly. It's just 
it's very hard to learn causation purely from perception. And for, for practical reasons, most of what's been do, done with AI in the last few years, since AI really started taking off, most of what's been done is perception oriented rather than integrated perception and action oriented. Right. Well, that sounds awesome because um, one of the things, this is a, like a pretty good thing by using math correlation, but they're not very, well, arguably, they're not very good at like um, answering why questions or discovering why stuff works. We're, you know, um, we're, we're, working that that whole, we're working on that uh, right, it, right it, now, it, actually. We're, we're, we're in, the, in the biology right. context and it, it works quite well. So I think it's just not what people have been focusing on. And th this gets back to more political issues and, and uh, a question I posed you earlier, like are we building a global brain that's a psychopathic idiot savant, right? Because most of what AI is being used in the world for now, I summarize as selling, spying, killing, and gambling, right? I, I, I mean, it's a, a advertising, surveillance, military, and, and then, uh, you know, financial prediction and, and trading. So, I mean, no, none of these requires you to answer why questions, right? I mean, that, 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 that's, that's not, you, 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 don't, you don't want to ask why your drone blew someone up, they're, 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 they're dead anyway. And I mean, you don't care why someone was stupid enough to buy this junk they didn't need. You, you just care that they whipped out their, their Apple Pay and bought it, right? So, I mean, I think the, f that the fact that we focus more on what than why is because it's been military advertising and, and, and Wall Street and they don't give a shit about, about why. They, they just want to make money or increase their, their national hedge money, right? So, I mean, I mean so we, we, we've been working on with the OpenCog AGI system embedded in, in Singularity Net platform, we, we, we've been working on using probabilistic logical reasoning together with evolutionary learning for analyzing genomics data. And the, the exact point there is to figure out why the machine learning results are what they are. So we can run our evolutionary learning system from OpenCog, uh, Moses, which you actually worked with a bit before, and then we can. We can run Moses on genomics data, on SNP data, on gene expression data, and like we're looking at data from supercentenarians, people who live 105 years or over. And so we can find out, well, these people who live a long time have variations in this gene and this gene or this gene and a lot of variations in that gene, but not so many in this region of the genome. And this collection of genetic variations is, is heavily correlated with living to 105 years or over, which is really interesting. But then what's the pathway of causation or what are the pathways of causation? They're usually multiple. Like what, why are those genetic variations leading to, leading to radical lo longevity, right? So now, now we're using OpenCog's logical reasoning engine to, to figure that out by bringing in a bunch of biology background knowledge from various online resources telling how biology works, right? So you're, you're interpreting the data analysis results in the context of the known mechanisms of biology, and, and then you're able to infer causal pathways. So if there were more people working on AI for understanding longevity and understanding the roots of disease, just as if there were more people working on AI to control autonomous robots wandering around in, in, in the street in an open environment, Applications like that drive toward causal understanding and, and answering why questions. And those just aren't the applications that are getting the bulk of the resources now. I mean, now almost everyone who gets a PhD in AI gets sucked into a few big companies to do, you know, selling, spying, killing, and gambling. And even if, even if they start a tech startup, the goal is to get bought within four or five years, which then sucks the whole team into one of these same big companies, which was the acquirer, right? So this, this then becomes a significant point of concern. Like so, suppose that the internet and all the AIs in the intercept self-organize and congeal into an emergent general intelligence whose only purpose in life is to spy on everyone, blow them up if they're part of the wrong religion, you know, cheat them out of their money by weird financial derivatives games, and sell them junk they don't need through, through fake ads, right? If, if this is what's on the mind of the first 
general intelligence to emerge from the collective global brain, what happens when this general intelligence becomes super intelligent, right? I mean, what, 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 what kind of like a schmuck head super AI are we building? We're, we're building, a, we're building a, a psychopath which has no compassion and, and just wants to achieve national hegemony and profit maximization. And we're building a system which is an idiot savant in the sense that it's really good at you know, figuring out what ad someone should stare at or, or figuring out whether someone's about to offend the government but it doesn't have much attention for anything else, right? So we, we probably don't want that. Like we, we don't know how much difference the initial condition makes. It could be that however we get the AGI started out, it's gonna to evolve to, towards some mind detractor, like regardless, regardless of the initial condition. On the other hand, it, it, it could be that the initial condition matters. And if we make a, a compassionate, creative, open-minded AGI first. It will be nice to humans and other sentient beings and do things that we like. If we make a psychopathic idiot savant AGI first, it, it may evolve into a, a super AI that, that we don't care for too much. And my working hypothesis is that the initial condition does matter. And I mean, we, we don't know, we, don't, we can't really have a fully fledged theory of, of what's gonna happen with minds once they're smarter than, than us. So we need to go by a mixture of reasoning and, and, and gut feel, right? But so, yeah, I've been, as you know, I've been working on a mix of things aimed at training AGI with OpenCog and another AGI r and I've been doing, and then things aimed at making sure the first AGIs are developed in a you know, beneficial and democratic way. We would work on beneficial applications like longevity in medicine and education, sustainability, and, and then, then with SingularityNet, which uh, attempts to make a sort of society of AI minds that's owned by all the programmers and users rather than by, by a large corporation. But uh, you know, it, will, it, will take, it will take more than me. So hopefully on future day, there's a bunch of young people out there who will, will orient, orient their future toward the creating AGI that's not only generally intelligent, but is, uh, is beneficial to all sentient beings. Because I, I, I want to see a beneficial singularity, and I, want, and I want to survive past it and, and keep, uh, keep enjoying it in, in some like mind-uploaded, uh, cyborgized, or, or currently unimaginable form. Indeed, yes, I agree. Um, I, I've, I've thought about this and, and I, I'm wondering, like, even if an AI is such a strong attractor for an AI to become ethical at some stage, it's that transition from where we are now to that, that goal of, or this strong attractor, this time in between could be quite devastating, right? Um, it might get there, but, you know, well, yeah, that's right. I mean, that's that's the natural human drama, right? It's, it's, it's a much better story when, on the way to becoming a productive, beneficial adult, you wreak a lot of havoc as a teenager, right? I mean, that that's the kind of story we want to see. So it's, uh, on the other hand, if that's a life path of the super AGI, this may be a very bratty teenager, and yeah, we we. The transition doesn't matter in a cosmic sense, but it matters a lot to us. Like it matters to me if I die or, or if you die. And in terms of things like global wealth inequality, it may be almost inevitable that in 50 years we have global superabundance. But if there's 20 years in there when Africa is starving and dying of curable diseases, while people in, in the developed world are like, relaxing in, in their armchairs, living on universal basic income, but being waited on by robot servants, like m made in the developing world by starving workers. I mean, this will probably lead to rampant terrorist activity and, and all, 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 all sorts of, of hassles, which will seem like a minor and irrelevant glitch to the super AIs in, in 2070, but will be very annoying to whoever is, is blown up in, 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 the, in the interim period. Yes. Awesome. That's it. That's great. Well, um, Ben, thanks very much. If you've got any like uh, 
something you'd say in an elevator to some rich guy if you wanted to convince him that you're going to create an understanding machine, why you should uh, you to do an so elevator to a rich guy. What, what, I, what I tend to say is like, why are $10 million to this account or my henchman will hunt down your children and mutilate them? No, wait, that's not it. That's, hold on. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I have no words of wisdom, and I have a conference going in, in a minute, so I, I'll, I'll leave the words of wisdom to you, Adam. Be careful what you wish for. Uh, <laughs> All uh, right, well, no, but thanks. This was um, a... Yeah, this, I'll speak this, to you this, in the this near a cool future. Topic. So I, I will, uh, yeah, I will uh, try to send you a link to this uh, recording later this yeah. afternoon, if I can find it on the Zoom interface. And,